Our debaters are very accomplished. They're good friends of the department and each other. They co-organize a group called Blameless Buffalo with a question mark that meets every month to discuss free will and moral responsibility. One of them believes no one in Buffalo can be blamed for the condition of Buffalo, nor can be, nor can be blamed that he's treated poorly during the question and answer period. While the other one believes there's plenty of blame in Buffalo to go around, and uh, he will resent uh, rude treatment during the question period. Dr. Steve Kirschner, a distinguished teaching professor and chair of the SUNY philosophy, SUNY Fredonia philosophy department. He has philosophy degrees from Iowa and Cornell and even a law degree from UPenn. He has written numerous books and papers on topics such as torture, affirmative action, pornography, hell, discrimination, the most valuable player in sports, capitalism, equal opportunity, slavery, and the nature of pleasure. He's the author of seven books, some of which have titles like Gratitude Towards Veterans, a Philosophical Explanation of Why Americans Should Not Be Very Grateful to Veterans, and he's also written for Torture, a Right-Based Defense. Steve's been described as a philosophical gadfly, and his, his writings and sometimes his PowerPoints remind us why academics need the protection of tenure. <laughs> and his opponent, John, John Keller, is a polymath and a renaissance man. He's an associate professor of philosophy at Niagara University. He works on metaphysics, epistemology, philosophy of language, ethics, and philosophy of religion. He did his dissertation at Notre Dame under the guidance of Peter Van Wagen, who incidentally is considered by many to be the foremost expert on free will, although Steve will disagree with that and not be impressed by John's intellectual pedigree. John's the author of several papers, including a prize-winning paper, Paraphrase, Semantics, and Ontology, the Oxford Study of Metaphysics. Other papers are in Katniss. He's got papers on philosophy of language, papers on philosophy of religion. He has a paper coming out on the anthology in Oxford, the elite philosophical press, on, uh, entitled Being Freedom and Method. I believe Steve will go first, talk 15, 20 minutes, and John will give his view. Um, Steve will argue we don't have free will, John will argue we do. Then they'll spend about five minutes talking about each other, and then we'll open it up to the audience where you can uh, ask questions, make comments, refute the speakers, audition to be our department's next debater in the spring. Before I start, I want to mention that it's just a real pleasure to be here um, and to work with such excellent philosophers as David Hirschnaff and John Keller. Um, they're absolutely superb intellects, top-line philosophers, and wonderful people. So it's just a real pleasure to be involved with them in philosophy and discuss ideas with them. I gain an enormous amount from them. OK, with that in mind, I'm going to argue that uh, we are not morally responsible and that we don't have free will in the sense that uh, we, that would ground responsibility. So what's my thesis? My thesis is no responsibility. Individuals are not morally responsible. And by individuals, I mean all of us, right? I, I, I should include all individuals. That would include God. That would include angels. That would include um, all of us as well. What do I mean by responsibility? OK, by responsibility, I mean just the ordinary sense of apt for praise and blame. I'm not sure that we're giving a definition of responsibility so much as just giving synonyms for it. And this is what I mean by responsibility. It's the sort of thing which leads to praise and blame judgments. So just a few cases, right? Some people think that Hitler is blameworthy for his activities. Um, this is gang violence. We often think that people are blameworthy for that. And that, in part, explains why they should be punished under the criminal justice system. Um, you might think that adultery is something that, that merits blame. And that's the sort of thing that presupposes responsibility. And Bernie Madoff, so embezzlement or financial crimes are the sort of thing that merit uh, blame and hence are a species of responsibility judgment. Uh, for my argument, we're going to need just a few concepts. They should be straightforward, but they're kind of the underpinning of the argument. So the first argument is that of a character state. Now, a character state is just someone's psychology at a time. Now, what do I mean by psychology? I mean just all of a person's mental states and the relations between them. So basically, what goes on in their head, right? All of their mental states, their beliefs, their desires, their intentions, and the relation between those elements. 
The next notion is that of a choice. A choice or a decision is the way in which someone cuts off deliberation. Right, so they're deliberating what to do, you know, should uh, I do the morally correct thing, should I do the wrong thing, and at some point in time they cut off the deliberation and form an intention. By intention I just mean a plan, and a decision is just that, um, it's just the means or the way in which a person cuts off deliberation and forms an intention. One more notion, and that is epistemic foundationalism. When it comes to what it means to have adequate evidence for our beliefs or adequate justification, one of the theories, and I think the correct theory, is what's called epistemic foundationalism. This says that some beliefs are justified but not justified by another belief. Either they're self-justified, they justify themselves, or they're justified by something that is not itself a justified belief. An example would be perception, right? Perhaps you perceive something and that justifies your belief, but the perception is not itself a justified belief. Of particular interest is what's called a self-justified belief. Think about the thought, I exist. You might think if you could understand that thought and form it, that justifies itself, because who is it that's having that thought? And a self-justified belief is one that a person is justified in believing simply in virtue of understanding it. So the idea is that some beliefs are justified not on the basis of other beliefs, but simply because someone understands it. Okay, so three basic concepts. Now my argument against responsibility. Straightforward argument. Premise one, if an individual is morally responsible, then there is a responsibility foundation that makes them morally responsible. So the idea is just as there are foundations in epistemology, that is with regard to um, evidence or knowledge, there are also foundations in responsibility. There's something that makes us morally responsible. So if we're responsible at all, then there is a responsibility foundation. But, premise two, sadly, there is no responsibility foundation that makes an individual morally responsible. When you combine those two premises, we end up with a conclusion that hence, an individual is not morally responsible. Okay, so my, my um, process will be straightforward. I'll take time to defend premise one in two steps and support premise two, and from that, the conclusion will hopefully follow. Okay, why would someone accept premise one? It's gonna be a two-step argument for premise one. The first step is that there are certain principles that we should accept as true, and the second step is that if we accept those principles, then we need a responsibility foundation. The first principle is act to choice. If a person's morally responsible for an action, an action, think of it as like a bodily movement that implements a plan or intention. Someone's responsible for an action only if he chose that action and was responsible for that choice. Basic idea is you're responsible for an action only if it flowed from some choice Right? It wasn't sort of automatic action or something that was outside of your control, and you're responsible for that choice. It wasn't imposed externally um, on you or against your will. The second and third principles are where the, actions are, where the action is. The second principle, and this is the one that Dr. Keller is going is, is to come after, um, is that if a person is morally responsible for his choice, then it flowed from his character state, and he is responsible for that character state. And the idea is that if you're responsible for a choice, it has to somehow connect up to you. And if it connects up to you, it has to connect up to your psychology or your character state, and you have to be responsible for that psychology or character state. So the idea is, if you're responsible for a choice, it had to flow from a character state, at least in part, and you had to be responsible for that character state. If it didn't flow from the character state at all, or if you weren't responsible for that character state, then it would not be attributable to you either at all if it didn't flow from a character state, or it would not be attributable to you in the right way if you were not responsible for the character state. So um, the idea is responsible for a choice then only if, in simple terms, it flows from a character state and you're responsible for that character state. The second principle is that a person is responsible for a character state only if it flowed from a choice and she is responsible for that choice. She's responsible for a character state, for your psychology, only if it flowed from a choice, and you're responsible for that choice. Why would someone accept that as true? 
Well, the way in which we control things, right? The way in which we control our actions, the way in which we control our thoughts, the way in which we interact with the world, our control, the control aspect of our lives comes about through choice. It's through choice that we do things, that we interact with the world, that we control our body, uh, that we control our thoughts. And the idea is if a person is responsible for something, then he has control over it. And if a person has control over something, it resulted from choice. Okay, this is fairly com a fairly common assumption. Not everyone in the literature accepts it, but, it, it, but it's, it's, it's widely held. That you're responsible for only those things that you can control. So for example, you're not responsible for Paris Hilton's dating habits uh, because you don't control those. This one says, well, the way we control things is through a choice. That's also fairly common. If you ask yourself, how exactly would I go about controlling things uh, other than sort of making decisions, we draw a blank. It seems that there's no way that we can control our actions except through, control anything except through a choice. In schematic form, again, you're responsible for an act only if it flowed from a choice. You're responsible for a choice only if it flowed from a character state and you're responsible for that character state. And you're responsible for a character state only if it flowed from a choice. This is explained by the fact that your choice has to be connected up to you or at least connected up to you in the right way. This is explained by the fact that um, your character state, your psychology, has to be controlled by you, and the way in which you control things is through a choice. So with that in mind, that's the schematics, and we ask ourselves, well, why do we need a foundation? Assuming that these principles are true, and I claim that they are intuitively clear um, and correct, the question is, why does that lead to a responsibility foundation? The idea is, when it comes to a justification of why are we more responsible, there's really only three possibilities. We could have an infinite series of choices and character states, one, after, one preceding the other, and that could explain why we're morally responsible. There could be a circular series whereby one choice depends on a preceding character state, the character state depends on another choice, but then it circles back on itself or there could be a foundation that is the basis for moral responsibility. Okay, again, using the, the um, diagram, you might think, well, it could be the case that someone's responsible for an action because there's an infinite sequence of character states and choices, right? This is obviously not going to be a good strategy for two reasons. One is, we're, you know, we, don't, we haven't lived infinitely far back in the past, so we don't make an infinite number of choices or have an infinite number of character states. But even if we did, even if we were infinite beings, the idea is that there's nothing there that would add responsibility to the system. It would be like a bunch of people all writing checks to one another when no one has any money in their bank account. If each person wrote a check to another person and no one had any money in her bank account, there'd be no transfer of funds. Something has to add funds into the system. Similarly, something has to add responsibility to the system. For those of you who've seen some value theory, there's the idea of intrinsic value, something which is valuable in and of itself, and extrinsic value, things which are valuable because they lead to intrinsic value. Not everything can be extrinsically valuable. Not everything can be valuable because of its relation to something else. There has to be a point at which the buck stops. And those are the foundation theories. The two foundation theories say that the foundation is either a choice or a character state. And the question is, will either one work as a foundation? OK, so just to review, we have three possibilities here. We could have an infinite sequence of choices and states. We could have a circular series of choices and states. Or we could have a foundation. This one's not going to work because nothing adds responsibility to the series. The analogy is to extrinsic value. This is not going to work for the same reason. Nothing adds responsibility to the series. Again, much like the check writing or extrinsic value. So if people are morally responsible and those principles are correct, then there has to be a foundation or something which by itself makes us morally responsible. And that's going to lead us to the second premise of the argument, right? which is that there is no responsibility foundation that makes an individual morally responsible. OK, so here's the heart of the argument. So the foundation could be either a choice or a character state. And the choice would either flow from a character state, sorry, not flow from a character state. It would kind of be freestanding 
or it would flow from the character state, but the person would not be responsible, does not have to be responsible for the character state. So either the choice is a foundation and it's not connected to a character state, or it is connected to a character state, but not one for which people are responsible. Alternatively, the foundation would be a character state, that is our psychology, and either it doesn't flow from choice, it's freestanding, or it does flow from choice, but we're not responsible for that choice. What's the matter with a choice that doesn't result from a character state? Well, imagine a person has a psychology, and then choices just happen that don't reflect what he thinks about the world. They don't reflect his beliefs, his desires, his reasoning. They're free-floating. If there are such choices, they would be analogous to self-justified beliefs, beliefs which justify themselves and don't rest on anything else. The problem with this is that such choices would not be connected to us at all. They would look like random or arbitrary occurrences. And it's hard to see how someone could be responsible on the basis of a random or arbitrary occurrence. That is, if your choices didn't reflect what you think about the world, what you believe, what you desire, what you intend, it would look like some random event. And that could not be the basis for you being praiseworthy or blameworthy. Alternatively, a choice could result from a character state, but you wouldn't be responsible for the character state. So for example, imagine, and I'll go over this example in a little more depth in a while, but imagine that um, Victor Frankenstein creates his monster from you know, dead body parts in the morgue, so he imposes the psychology on the monster, and then you know, seconds after the monster's born, uh, created, the monster does something horrible, like strangle a young girl to death. That's the sort of thing that monsters do. Could you be responsible if you are not responsible for your character state or your psychology? It's hard to see how that could occur. Your choice would not reflect you, or at least not reflect anything that can be properly attributed to you. And if it can't be affected by anything that can be properly attributed to you, at least in the relevant sense, it's hard to see how that would ground responsibility. So the example here, would, the problem would be that it would be not properly connected to the person, and the example would be um, that of a monster. All right, so let me, let me go over the monster example. So Dr. Frankenstein creates an individual, a monster with a complete psychology. A psychology is a complete set of mental states and the relations between them. The monster's acts flow from his psychology, environment, and the laws of nature. Leave aside whether these determine or merely probabilistically shape his acts. His psychology is such that he is rational, he's a rational egoist in all circumstances, except when he interacts with other monsters, then he's a pure altruist. Or it doesn't have to be that pure. It can just be probabilistically. 98% you know, of the time, um, he's going to be an altruist in, in these circumstances, and 97% of the time, he's going to be uh, a, an egoist in these other circumstances. The monster is weak, weakly reason responsive, sane. His desires line up with one another. He has freedom of action and the will. But immediately after creation, the monster kills a little girl because he enjoys doing so. We might even make him the libertarian source. Right? That is, he has um, the relevant type of free will. Right? Source of his act. I would argue that intuitively the monster is not responsible even though it was his choice that brought about the killing. Why? Because he's not responsible for the psychology from which the choice flowed. And if you're not responsible for the psychology from which your choice flows, then you're not responsible for the choices that uh, come about from them. Now some people don't like that, right? Some, some of the people um, in the literature, some of the philosophers um, claim, well, no, the monster might be responsible because even though he is created from, you know, uh, completed, created in the whole and promptly made a choice, still it was his choice, it's attributable to him, it, you know, he could have done otherwise, and I claim that that's not our intuitions. Just one more example, and this is going to be a case of manipulation, and it focuses on the case of Igor, right, who is, you know, Victor uh, Frankenstein's helper, and, uh, and the case is ripped off from the actual case of Patty Hearst. She was a rich heiress who was attending Berkeley, and a radical group, the Simeonese Liberation Army, grabbed her up and tortured her, sleep deprived her, and eventually, on, the, on, on the, the sort of standard account of it, brainwashed her into believing in their radical campaign, after which she took part in bank robberies and other crimes. 
And the case is going to be a little more hypothetical, but it's designed on the Patty Hearst case. OK, so we have the case of Igor. And uh, Dr. Frankenstein manipulates an individual, Igor, by redoing, redoing his whole psychology, destroying his memory of, his, of the old one. A psychology is the complete set of mental states and the relations between them. Then Igor's acts flow from a psychology, so he makes a choice, but he's not responsible for psychology because, again, Dr. Frankenstein has completely reshaped it through manipulation. Now, I claim intuitively that Igor is not responsible, even though he made a choice, and his choice has every responsibility conferring feature, with the exception of uh, it's flowing from a character state from which he's responsible. If Igor is not responsible, for the same reason the monster is not responsible. So why are you not responsible for a choice that results from a character state from which the person is not responsible? Well, because it's not properly connected up to you, like in the case of monster, like in the case of Igor. The two other possibilities have similar problems. Right? In the case of a character state or psychology, if this didn't result from choice, if you were just born with a particular uh, uh, character state, or you were just given to it by a creator when you were created uh, from nothing as, as a, a full-fledged adult, then um, the character state wouldn't result from choice. Again, this would be like a self-justified belief, but you would have no control over it. If your psychology was just imposed on you, or you were created with that psychology, you would have no control over it because you didn't choose it. And if you have no control over something, then you're not responsible for it. Same thing if you have a character state, like your psychology, and it resulted from a choice, but you're not responsible for the choice. The choice was made for you by a hypnotist, or by an evil demon, uh, or by some neuroscientist, or some other interfering agent, so you were made to choose that psychology, but it wasn't a choice for which you're responsible. Again, um, you wouldn't have control, and um, uh, you wouldn't be responsible. So these cases are all similar to the monster case, right? The monster was given a psychology, but he's not responsible just for having that psychology. And that's true whether or not he, if, if he didn't choose it, and even if he did, but he's not responsible for that choice. So, I think there are four possibilities then for a responsibility foundation. A choice that does not flow from a character state and one that does, a character state that flows from choice, and one that doesn't flow from choice, and none of those can be a responsibility foundation, and those are the most plausible accounts of it. John's going to argue for something called libertarianism. So libertarianism says, kind of, you, you're responsible because you could choose one thing or the other. And the example I gave here is a former presidential candidate, Gary Hart. And Gary Hart had a long-time, stable, loving wife. And he could have stayed true to her. Or he could have gotten on the boat called the monkey business and had an affair with a very young, very attractive woman named Donna Rice. And the question is, he kind of faced, you know, Paz, and he had to decide which way to go down. Well, you know the way this one works out, right? Um, no question he went this way. Ended up on the monkey business and his campaign went down in flames. And the claim is that it is the fact that a person can make different choices that explains why he's morally responsible. But I think this fails on something called the luck argument. So let me just go over this pretty quickly. Um, the argument is that if a person, if libertarianism is true, that is if a person has free will in the ordinary sense, then he's morally responsible because he can act differently in the actual world and the possible world actual world, the possible world. And that shows you can go down one path or you can go down the other. Premise two, if a person is morally responsible because he can act differently in the actual world and a relevant possible world, then he is morally responsible because his act is random or arbitrary. That is, there's nothing about the person that would explain why he went one direction rather than the other. Given that up until the time he made a decision, his character is what it is. It's the same. He has the same beliefs, desires, intentions. And then he chooses to either stick with his wife or to go out, get on the monkey business and have an affair with Donna Rice. So the idea is that his character, his psychology can't explain why he got on the monkey business. There's nothing else that can explain it. And hence, it's some random or arbitrary fact. So conclusion three, hence, if libertarianism is true, then a person is morally responsible because his act is random or arbitrary. But it's false that you can be responsible because your act is random or arbitrary. That is, if your choice 
or your action is not explained by your character state, that is your psychology, you're not responsible. And hence libertarianism is false. Okay, so that was, that was a little bit too quick, but the rough idea is that you're responsible on the basis of a foundation, and the foundation has to be either a choice or a character state. If you can't identify the foundation, you haven't explained moral responsibility. That's it, thank you. All right, thanks so much for coming. I just wanna thank um, Professor Hershenov and uh, Teresa for organizing this, uh, and for everyone else involved in the organization, and especially um, Steve, Dr. Kirshner, for, for coming to, to debate. So, so I'm, I'm kind of nervous. Uh, not only do I have to debate Steve Kirshner, which is you know, roughly the least, uh, the person I want to debate least in, in, in the world, or at least the, the only person I'm likely to debate, I guess. I'm, I might maybe rather debate Steve than like Plato or something, but Plato's been dead for a while. Um, but, but I also feel like it's really important that um, I win this debate. So, you know, studies, studies show that if you don't believe you have free will, you, uh, you're liable to behave worse than if you do believe you have free will. So, so this isn't just some sort of intellectual issue. It affects people's behavior. Um, uh, so, you know, you know please, please listen as sympathetically as possible and then just hum to yourself when he's talking and think about uh, the bills. Um, all right, so I want to defend um, three theses. One, that we have free will. And by that I mean we're sometimes able to do more than one thing. I'm going to contend that we've all done stuff uh, such that we could have not done it, right? So once, uh, when I was 18 years old, we had this uh, festival uh, and a bunch of hippies show up and sell, sell little trinkets in booths. And I went to this festival with some friends of mine and they uh, thought, why don't we steal some necklaces uh, and give them to our mothers for Mother's Day. Um, and it's sort of easy to steal from these hippies because they're a little bit out of it. And I don't know, I really, I, I don't really believe in stealing. I don't know, some people don't think it's that bad. I, I, I don't know, I like just want to kill people. Um, if somebody steals from me, I really don't think stealing's okay. But um, I don't know, my friends were doing it and I didn't want them to think I was like some sort of goody-goody. And so I stole a necklace from this poor spaced out hippie, and um, here's something that just seems clearly true. I, 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 it's po it, it would have been possible for me not to do that, right? I could have, could have not done that, right? And, and if that's true, if I was able to both refrain from stealing the necklace and I, I was obviously able to steal the necklace, then I've got free will. I also think that I'm morally responsible for that. I think that the fact that the the hippie had a, you know, inventory shortage uh, that evening was, was my fault. I'm blameworthy uh, uh, for, for stealing um, from that hippie. And, I, and I, I think those two things are connected. I think we can only be blameworthy if we're free. And I think, I, I think Steve would, would agree with that last point. So it's really the first two points that are um, things we disagree about. So as Steve said, I mean, I think a very nice way of thinking about what it is to have free will or would be to have free will is to be in a position to be able to do more than one thing. So, you know, if you're walking down this path you see up on the screen, it sure looks like you're able to go left and you're able to go right. And so you're able to do more than one thing. And if that's uh, ever the case, you know, again, this is just sort of what it means to have free will. If we do have free will, I mean, you could think of our life as we're, we're sort of going down a garden of forking paths and we choose to go left and we choose to go right. And obviously once we've made the choice, right, we can't, uh, you know, on a, real, on a real road, you can always go back and, and, you know, if you take a wrong turn, you just go backwards and, and go the other way. Unfortunately in life, if you take a wrong turn, you can't go back and just, just redo it. You're sort of stuck with the consequences. If we don't have free will, that's, that's an illusion, right? I don't know how this will look to you, but, but if you can clearly see that those paths don't, link, you know, don't all link up, then you can sort of squint a little bit so that you can't clearly see it. But, but from a certain distance, right, it would look like that was a garden of forking paths, but in reality, it's not, right? In reality, there's just one path, and there's no way, uh, let's say, to get from the one path to the other ones. And so that's what would be the case if free will were an illusion. 
So I feel like it's real important that I convince you that you have free will, uh, but I also feel like I'm in a really awkward situation trying to argue for free will. And that's because, I mean, by my lights, the fact that we have free will is sort of like the fact that we're conscious or the fact that we experience pain or the fact that we know some stuff or the fact that there's an external world. And that's, what I mean by that is, all of those things are more certain or more obvious than any philosophical argument that could be given for them, right? So I'm gonna try and give you a couple different arguments that we have free will, but most fundamentally, I mean, you know, what you have here, I mean, I, I just think you know that you're free. You know there have been times when you did something and you could have done something else. What could convince you that that was false? So fundamentally, I just think, look, right, you know there are uh, times in your life when you've done one thing and could have done another, when you've done things that were preventable, right? And if you know that, then you know that you have free will. This is just the definition of free will. And obviously, if you know you have free will, uh, you got to have free will. It's true that you have free will. So in a way, you might just think, well, what the, what, the, what the hell kind of an argument is this? It sort of seems like it's begging the question. It's just sort of starting out with, with this claim that we know that um, we make these sorts of choices that we can choose between alternative paths. And yeah, it is. And I, I do have another argument for you, but I just want to stop and, and think about the methodology of philosophy and the methodology of, of life in general. It's very common. People have a sort of instinctual attraction to the idea that when you ask a question like, hey, do I have free will, you should just sort of set aside everything you know and everything you believe about free will and just sort of start from scratch. So maybe you've studied Descartes and you know that you know, Descartes wanted to, you know, began his investigations into the world by just sort of trying to doubt everything and then see what he could kind of figure out on the basis of nothing at all, basically. You know, you could think about some different examples of this. I mean, so there are philosophers, and there's this big debate about consciousness, and some people deny that consciousness exists. And you might think, you know, some people might say, well, look, you can't just say, well, obviously consciousness exists. I'm conscious right now, because that's just sort of begging the question. You have to start out kind of neutral about whether consciousness exists, and then see if you can establish that consciousness exists without, you know, sort of making any presuppositions. Um, about consciousness. And I, I just think this is sort of wrong-headed. I mean, the, this sort of approach very often leads to skepticism. There's a very famous problem of other minds. So again, like I said, some people don't believe in consciousness. I mean, you might just think something's just gone seriously wrong if you have any doubts about whether you're conscious, right? You're just sort of introspectively, you know, aware of your own conscious states. Likewise, uh, you know, there's this famous problem of other minds in philosophy. And the problem is, if we start out just sort of neutral and say, hey, I don't know, d d does anyone else have a mind? I mean, I know I have a mind, right? Here I am thinking. But maybe you guys are just a bunch of unthinking robots, just meat machines. And it just looks like you have a mind because, I don't know what, God, God made you that way or something, right? Well, if you start out just sort of neutral about that question and then say, well, what kind of evidence do I have that you guys really do have minds and you're not just cleverly designed meat robots? Well, it's pretty hard to come up with a convincing argument that you guys really have minds, you know? Um, so I think this approach is misguided. Starting out just sort of ignoring kind of what it sure seems like we know about the world. It sure seems like I know that you guys have minds. I mean, I've had various conversations with friends and family um, that, that would seem to indicate that they have mental states. I think, uh, I think it's a mistake to ignore uh, our knowledge of our own conscious states when we think about consciousness. You know, the paradigmatic example of this is external world skepticism. So again, if you, if you read Descartes, I mean, Descartes starts out by just denying or uh, uh, doubting that um, there is an external world, and then he tries to see if he can give an argument that there's an external world starting from a, a position of agnosticism, of neutrality, about whether there's an external world. And Descartes very famously sort of fails in doing this, and then, you know, there's, there's a hundred, hundreds of years of sort of skeptical philosophy that follow, and people are like, well, maybe, that, you know, then you have idealists, and like, gosh, we can't know there's an external world. Maybe there is no external world. Maybe the world's all in our heads. I mean, it's just a sickness. It's a madness. Don't, don't ignore what you know, 
right? You know some stuff. It's, knowledge is, is damn hard to get. Uh, don't, don't, don't try to forget what you know. Um, use what you know to learn more. So I, th- I mean, I think our knowledge of our own conscious state should guide our theorizing about consciousness, right? I think I know various sort of boring facts about my friends and family and their mental states, and I think that should, you know, you know, that immediately entail that there are other minds and that I know about them. Uh, you know, I know that there's a bunch of people in this room, uh, and so obviously there's an external world, right? You guys aren't in my mind. I know that, so I know there's an external world done. And again, you might think, gosh, that's too fast, that's cheesy, but, but it's right, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, don't I know that there's an external world since I know you guys are there? I, I think I do. So, so I know I'm not talking about free will, but I do think this methodological question is very, very important. And so again, I mean, I, I, this isn't going to be my, my only argument, but, but I do think, just ask yourself, do you know whether you've ever faced a fork in the road and had the ability to go two different ways? If you know that you've faced such a fork and had the ability to go different ways, then you know you have free will. Let's not make this harder than it is. Um, I, I just think there's lots of stuff that, that, that is just extremely obvious. And, and saying that we know that it's true is maybe a little bit contentious, but, but here's a less contentious way of putting it. Even if you were sort of not 100% sure of anything, maybe you don't want to say you, 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 know, you know that you face such a fork in the road, surely the idea that you face such a fork in the road is more plausible than like these, these crazy principles uh, Steve is giving up there uh, to use in his argument that you've never faced such a fork in the road. And I'm not trying to be sort of anti-intellectual. I'm not saying, oh, these crazy, you know, abstract intellectual principles, this is useless. You just need to like stay rooted in the world and not think about it. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying, I, I, I mean, I'm a philosopher. I love thinking about this stuff. I just think, don't forget what you know from your everyday life when you conduct your philosophical inquiry. So I think, you know, we know we face such paths. I think we know that we do things that are wrong, right? I stole that necklace, right? I mean, I was sitting there sweating bullets, just thinking like, God, what sort of a schmuck am I that I'm going to steal this necklace? I don't even like this stupid necklace. I'm just stealing it because I don't know what. I don't want my friends to make fun of me. I mean, (laughs) that was wrong. I, I know it. We know that certain things are, are people's fault. Um, I, I think this stuff is some of the most obvious stuff we know about the world, right? Uh, a 10-year-old kid knows this stuff, right? And so I think we would need a really amazing argument for it to be rational for us to doubt that we have free will or that we're morally responsible and so on. And I mean, you know, you know look, I, I, I think Steve's giving a great argument, but it's not... I mean, it's not just sort of rationally overpowering, right? Uh, And we're going to talk about some of the reasons I don't think it's rationally overpowering uh, in a bit. So let me give you another argument that maybe will give you a little bit more to chew on for why we have free will. So I've already told you the the necklace story. I I think the fact that I shouldn't have stolen that necklace is like one of the most obvious facts there are, right? The fact that people sometimes do things that they shouldn't is again, one of the most obvious facts about the world there could be, right? So just take, take me for example. So, you know, here's the argument. I shouldn't have stolen that necklace. That's the, the main premise. Well, if I should not have stolen that necklace, then I should have done something else. Well, if I should have done something else, then there must have been something else for me to do. And if there was something else for me to do, then I was able to do something else. And if I was able to do something else, then I have free will, right? I, I was able to do what I did, obviously. I was able to steal the necklace, because I actually did. And I was able to do something else. There were two things I was, able to, I was able to do. That's just what it is to have free will. So again, I think the first premise of this argument is just, just obviously true. Uh, the other premises sure look like conceptual truths. So if I'm right about this, this just establishes that we've got free will. A lot of people think that there have been, there's scientific evidence that we don't have free will. You know, if you look at this, I, I, I think this really is, is, not, is not the case. So the most famous of all these scientific arguments is, is uh, given by LeBay, and I, I just think, you know, it's not an argument that we don't have free will, and indeed, he 
seems to admit that we've got what you might call veto power. So he gives this argument that we get these urges, we only become consciously aware of these urges, as it were, after they've occurred and after we're sort of already on, on the path to doing something. And so the idea is basically, since we can't sort of consciously generate our own urges, we're not free. But he actually thought we had veto power over these urges. And look, if you have veto power over these urges, I don't know what, you're in this boat, it always, uh, I don't know, it's always veering right. <laughs> but you can always, you know, turn it to the left, let's say. Well, if you can always turn it to the left, if you can veto this sort of rightward urge the, the boat has, then you've got free will, right? There's, there's more than one thing you could do. So I'm not going to go through all of these details. You can look through them if you're interested. They, they didn't really come up in, 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 in Steve's talk. But I do think it's really important. We can talk about this in the Q&A if you want. I think it's very important to see that these, these scientific arguments are pretty darn shaky. Um, I don't think we've got anything close to sort of a very convincing scientific argument uh, that there's not free will. This is a, going back a bit to this sort of general methodological point. I don't have a very nice, neat story to you about exactly what free will is and how it works. I think that free will is in many ways a mystery, right? We don't really understand it. We don't know what it works. We don't even know how it's possible in a sense. And you might think, well, gosh, if, if it's this big mystery, that means we should doubt or deny that free will exists, right? I mean, we shouldn't believe in stuff that's just sort of beyond our understanding. But it's really important to see that that's not true. And indeed, we should believe in stuff that's beyond our understanding all the time, right? So think about um, quantum mechanics. I'm not going to go into the details. But I mean, many features of quantum mechanics are simply mind boggling. I mean, they, they literally, in, in a very serious sense, make no sense. But we should accept this theory. It's extremely well empirically confirmed, right? Yeah, the world's a crazy, mysterious, puzzling place. Uh, just the mere fact that quantum mechanics sort of blows our minds and, and is hard to wrap our heads around isn't a reason to reject it. Next, think about aboutness. This is a little bit of a weird, a weird phrase, but you know, we we think about stuff, right? Obviously, uh, right now. Most of us, some of us are thinking about free will. Some of you are thinking about what you're going to do when you leave. Some of you aren't thinking at all because you're just meat machines. Um, but what aboutness is, how, how it is that our thoughts get to be about stuff, again, is like an ancient mystery. We don't understand how that works. But like, obviously, that's not like, OK, well, I guess nobody ever thinks about anything. I don't know, we shouldn't believe in stuff that's beyond our understanding or that's mysterious, right? We know that we think about stuff, right? Right now, I'm thinking about, you know, how nervous I am up here. Um, consciousness is a mystery. Mathematical knowledge is a mystery. Wrongness is a mystery. I mean, we don't have a very good definition of life, right? We can't say exactly what it is that makes something alive versus dead. Uh, we don't understand personal identity. There's no uh, uncontroversial definition of truth. Uh, we, we don't know what it is to have a belief. I mean, all of this stuff is, is pretty mysterious once you really start thinking about it. But of course, that shouldn't shake our conviction that some things are alive and some things are dead, that we have knowledge, that people persist through time, and so on. We're sort of going back and forth, but I guess because Steve already talked about his stuff, and I think I've got a couple extra minutes, I just want to talk a little bit about um, some, of the, some of the problems I see with his um, argument. So again, I'm defending the claim that we have free will and that we're morally responsible. Uh, those two claims Dr. Kirshner disagrees with, and um, I think actually we both agree that you have to have free will in order to be morally responsible. Let me just make a few nitpicky points about the argument. So, so again, from my general perspective, I just want to remind you of how at least I think you should be thinking about this issue, unless we've got some like amazing, you know, compelling argument that we don't have free will, of course we should believe that we have free will. So let me just sort of try and poke some holes in this argument. So let's start with this principle two, which says choice to character state. Right? And it says, if, if a person is responsible for his choice, then it flowed, at least in part, from his character state, and, his, and he is responsible for that state. Now, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not trying to get all anal retentive, but 
it's not totally clear to me what it means for an action to flow from a character state. I guess I think I have kind of an intuitive idea. And so here's how this intuitive idea works. Here's a fact about my character state. I'm heterosexual. I'm romantically attracted to human females. As such, basically, whenever I try to, you know, romance someone, it's, it's always a woman, right? If I ever did try to romance a man, that would definitely be out of character uh, for me. I don't know if that'll ever happen, but probably not. I don't know. So in one sense, I mean, there's just certain things that my character is constraining regarding my action. But it does seem like I have a choice, right? So, so when I romance a woman, that is flowing from my character. It does seem like I have a choice about which women I romance and when. So like, as a matter of fact, I'm, you know, married. And so the fact that I'm married, you know, places certain constraints on which women I'm, you know, permitted to romance. Now let's say I just <laughs> ignore those constraints and, um, you know, put the moves on uh, uh, Dr. Kirshner's girlfriend, right? Despite the fact that she's taken and I'm married, right? So this action, in one sense, seems to be flowing from my character, right? It's flowing from the fact that I'm, I'm a heterosexual ma male man. Um, I've got some control over, you know, whether I romance her or not. It, it seems like I'm perfectly responsible for this, even though I'm not responsible for the fact that I'm heterosexual, of course. I mean, right, I, I don't have control over, over that fact about myself. So I, I don't have control over that. I'm not responsible for my character state. I want to talk about the monster and Iger cases. So in both of these cases, their psychology is such that they always act like a rational egoist. They always just do basically what they think is going to make themselves better off, except when they're interacting with other monsters, but let's ignore that. But I mean, part of the case is supposed to be that these, these people have free will. Monster and Iger have free will, but it's not totally clear. Uh, I, I mean, I guess in theory, you, you can maybe make some sense of this, right? But Again, remember, free will is having the ability to do two different things. If they always just choose the selfish, ac selfish action when they're interacting with non-monsters, it's a little hard to believe or understand the claim that they could go either way, right? If you're in a boat that always goes left, I mean, it's just parentally, I don't know what parentally going left, you know, I mean, I, don't, I guess maybe in theory some crazy thing could happen and, and it would go right, but it seems like you've got a lot, lot of evidence that the boat can't go right. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just got an irresistible leftward, you know, lean to it. So I don't, I don't think we should believe that they're free, and if they're not free, I don't think, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that they're morally responsible, but, but, but so what? But the difference between them and us is that we're free. I want to say a quick word about the libertarian argument. So there's a couple premises in Dr. Kirshner's argument. Premise one says, if libertarian is true, we're, we are responsible because we act differently in different possible scenarios. And what I want to say is, libertarianism requires more than that. An electron, right? I mean, quantum mechanics is an indeterministic theory. Electrons behave differently in different possible scenarios, right? But they don't have free will, right? That, that is just randomness. So libertarians might say, yeah, p people are responsible because, partly because they act differently in different circumstances. Partly because, not wholly because, right? And so because they're just saying that it's partly because, I mean, there's room for them to say that our decisions are not random. Our decisions are influenced by our character, let's say, just like my, my decisions about who to romance are influenced by my character without being determined by it. All right, let me just make one last point and then I'll shut up. He talks about control via choice and says to be in control of something, you always have to be controlling something through a choice. And um, again, maybe I'd be interested to hear more about this, but I think that this doesn't intuitively is not a, a true principle, right? Think about riding a bike. You're controlling the bike in all sorts of ways. You're, you're leaning and, and balancing in all sorts of ways. The ways in which you're controlling the bike are not via choices. I mean, if you turn left or right, that's on the basis of a choice. But you're making you know, many different um, adjustments to the bike every 
every 10 seconds or so, and almost none of those are by explicit choice. And so I think you can control, just like you can control a bike without, without um, making choices about, about it, um, you know, uh, perhaps it's possible to control other things without making conscious choices. Thanks so much. All right, as, as always with John's arguments, they're always worth listening to, they're always informative, you always gain from them. Um, however, on, on this topic, I have to disagree. So let's, let's review sort of where we are in the argument. Um, so we're gonna cut over to Donna Rice again. Dr. Keller's picture is that what makes someone responsible, at least in part, is the fact that they can go, they can stay faithful, or they can have an adulterous affair. So somehow part of the explanation is that they can go either way and that we know that. And the sort of knowledge that underlies the fact that we have free will also underlies the fact that we're morally responsible. So it's the same sort of thing supports both claims. Okay, in terms of my claim, what is the responsibility foundation? If I understood Dr. Keller correctly, what he argues is the responsibility foundation, that is what makes us morally responsible, is at bottom a choice. And that's true even if the choice um, flows from a character state and we're not responsible for that character state. That is, the responsibility foundation is a choice and the principle we have to jettison then is the second principle, namely that you can be responsible for a choice even if either the choice did not flow from the character state or the choice did flow from the character state, but you're not responsible for it. So um, let me cut ahead to sort of try and show you why I disagree. What Dr. Keller is arguing is that character influences the choice, but does not determine it. That's why you know, Dr. Keller has, has a really good moral character for those who know him, but still it doesn't rule out his having an affair. Rather, he has to exercise his free will to avoid it. And that's, in fact, what makes him responsible. What he says, it's, it's an individual's contribu additional contribution above and beyond the character influence is what makes them morally responsible. And so the additional contribution is the, what explains free will and also explains moral responsibility. And that's what I want to deny. I want to deny that someone has a contribution above and beyond their character. So here's a case. What I want to claim in particular is that a person does not make a, a, a contribution above and beyond the character influence. That is, for the purposes of responsibility, all of the relevant contribution comes from the character, whether or not it's determined or whether or not it's really probabilistic. And I'm citing Peter Van Inwagen, a very famous, very important metaphysician, and um, Dr. Keller is one of the worldwide experts on uh, Peter Van Inwagen. In fact, he was his dissertation advisor. So this is an argument called the rollback argument. So here's the case. Alice and other drivers see a badly injured child. She can help the injured child by driving him to the doctor, or she can drive to her rehearsal dinner. For God's sake, she's getting married. God rewinds the universe and replays it a thousand times. 500 times she stops to help the child, and 500 times she drives on to the rehearsal dinner. That is, they're equally likely. What does Alice contribute above and beyond the character influence? What can we say about Alice that adds to the picture? Her character is the same up until the time she makes the decision. So what does she add to the picture? It can't be a choice because what would the choice be based on? The choice is based on the same thing both times. So it's unclear how the choice itself could carry weight. It can't be her because if you asked, well, why did she cause herself to stop in one scenario or drive on in another? It looks random or arbitrary. There's no reason that she has, or at least no reason that she can cite from her mental states that explains why she does one thing rather than the other. So if we ask what it is that she contributes to this picture, the answer is nothing. Hence, the fact that she in fact stopped to help the individual rather than driving on is random or arbitrary, and moral responsibility cannot rest on randomness or arbitrariness. So that's the, the slogan, roll it back, right? So if you roll back your decision a thousand times, what would happen? We have to say what would happen independent of your character and why would that ground responsibility? In particular, Dr. Keller argues 
that principle two is false. That if a person is more responsible for his choice, then it flowed at least in part from his character, and he is responsible for that character state. Dr. Keller claims that's false, that you can be responsible for your choice even if you're not responsible for the character state that from which it flowed. And I claim this is strongly counterintuitive, right? We don't think this about the monster case, if someone has created whole and makes it, promptly makes a decision. We don't think this about manipulation, if Igor's psychology is entirely redone by Victor Frankenstein. We don't think that grounds responsibility. Why? Well, the reason is that if you're not responsible for your character, you're not responsible for, for what flows from it. Now, let me step a little bit about, just quickly address uh, methodology. Dr. Kelly makes a good point. We should be very wary of rejecting common sense beliefs, things that we know immediately, things that we know intuitively. But we should reject them when we have good reason to do so. Here we have good reason to do so. We know need, we need a foundation for responsibility. We further know that we don't have one, and that provides us with the strong reason to reject moral responsibility. That's it, thank you.